All right, imagine I offered you the opportunity to jump on with either boat A or boat B. So the first boat that you could jump on was amazing. It had multiple rooms that you could stay in. It allowed closet space for you to bring anything you wanted aboard. It had some of the nicest restaurants and entertainment. It was beautiful in all of its, uh, of its design. It was remarkable. It was the envy of the world. Or there is another boat that I offer you. It's a bit more subtle. It's handmade. It's its own beauty in a sense, but it's much smaller. It probably has half a dozen seats or so. You have to power it, but you like it. You get to be the director of it. You get to be the one that kind of shows, or you get to be the one that says, okay, this is where I belong and where I get to be. And so there's two different boats you could jump on. This beautiful, luxurious boat or this simple handmade boat, how would you decide which one to get into? Well, there's probably an essential question to be asked, and the answer to that essential question would help determine which boat was right for you. We're in a series called Questions Jesus Asked, and we're looking at questions in which Jesus draws out from us our answers, what's going on in our heart to help us understand where we are with him, where we are with one another, where we are with ourselves, and help drive a decision for these. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to Mark chapter 8, and we're going to bump into a question that Jesus asks today that will help us determine which boat is right for us. This is Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and this comes right on the heels of Jesus asking a previous question, that's not our question today, of of who do people say that I am? Like a lot of people are following me, a lot of people have benefited from my ministry, there's a lot of conversation around me, who do people say that I am? And there were different opinions about who Jesus was, and then Peter, Peter says, you're the Christ, You're the anointed one, the promised one, the rescuer that is said to come to redeem all things. And it's like, yes, Peter, you get it. So verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's the title, the Messiah. This is an Old Testament title from Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, that's the religious leaders, and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him will the Son of Man be also ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with his holy angels. The question we're going to be looking at is in the middle of that teaching, what does it profit a man, what does it profit a woman to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? That's a question that we're, we're probably familiar with when when we're talking to a financial advisor or an investor, these are the terms of financial success, profits, gains, losses. You want profits, you want gains in your portfolio, you want to avoid losses if you're gonna be successful. And Jesus takes financial terminology to talk about true success, what is of most value. And he says, okay, what does it value a person to have great profits and gains in a portfolio and then look very successful if that aim of success isn't the true aim and it actually becomes a huge 
loss, because they forfeit something. Now, if you forfeit something, that means you willingly lose. You choose to lose. Now, we're all choosing to lose out on something. Every time we say yes to something, we're choosing to say no to something else. And so what does it mean to choose to lose your soul? That's a big question, isn't it? Aren't you glad you got up early today? All right, let's pray and ask God for help. Lord, you asked this question to surface within us what we're choosing today. Well, we have chosen and an opportunity to choose. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher this morning. We pray that you would help illuminate the text in our minds, that we would have eyes and ears to see what you're up to, and that you would draw us to yourself. Father, we thank you that you are interested in our success and help us to frame what success really is and what it's not and help us to value what's truly valuable and say yes to the right things. So it's in the name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Jesus isn't really looking for an answer. What would it profit a person, a woman in this room or a man in this room to gain everything in the world at the cost of losing their soul? The answer to that would be nothing, right? It's a rhetorical question. The, the answer to the question is in the question itself. What would it gain? It would gain them nothing. But you'd have to understand probably what a soul is. This is a, this is a lost word in our society. What does it mean to have a soul, to be a soul? What is a soul? Well, we, we use the term that someone can lose their soul. We often describe someone who has maybe compromised on their morals. They have, they have so chosen different um, relationships, backroom deals, maybe it's something in their, in their politic in which they have risen to power. We've said they have gotten to that position at the cost of losing their soul. So there's something that we're, we have in our mind. But oftentimes when we're around great wealth or we're around people who are very successful, we wonder how they get here. Did they compromise their soul? And, and the soul conversation is often lost around people who are very, very successful in the world. And then it's really amazing that it just shows up out of nowhere and it kind of shocks everyone who's listening when they hear the word soul. Chris Pratt, really funny actor. He's Garden of the Galaxies. He's the one that was on Parks and Rec. Back in 2018, he received an award at the MTV Awards. Maybe you remember this, maybe you don't. Um, maybe you're like, I've never seen an MTV Award in my life. That's okay. Uh, you're probably really old. Um, it's okay. <laughs> I haven't really seen an MTV award either. So there was an award given to the, uh, the gener it was called the Generation Award. It was given to an actor or an actress that was kind of the epitome of like being the generation's elder, the example to follow. And they gave it to Chris Pratt. And Chris Pratt got up there and he received the Generation Award. And he said, as, as your elder, I have nine or, nine or 10 rules for living, for life. And I'm going to give you nine rules for life. And they were comedic kind of rules, and then they were also spattered in with some really seriousness. And so he began with rule number one, which was a, was a funny one. It said, you, sorry, uh, rule number one, breathe. If you don't, you'll suffocate. You're like, that's a, that's a general good rule for life. And then rule number two, he says, is you have a soul. Be careful with it. Now just imagine, this is, this is the epitome of success and fame. He's acquired everything. This generation that says, you are our elder, you're our leader. We, we would aspire to be you. And in rule number two, he reminds them, you have a soul. Now they probably haven't heard that word much. And you should pay attention to it, he says. And then he tells a couple more jokes. And then he, he gets to rule number six. It says, God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe that. I do. He's trying to orient them to something bigger than himself, something bigger than the award ceremony, bigger than the award he just received. Like, this is nice, but there's a God, and he loves you and cares for you. Believe that. Like, put that in your mind. I, I believe that. He's telling them, this is something that I have oriented my life around. You should orient your life around this truth. And then he tells a few more jokes, and, and here's rule number eight. 
learn to pray, it's easy and it's good for your soul. There's something about praying that's not just about getting things from God. It's being connected to God in such a way that it's beneficial to your soul, he says. So generation, learn to talk with God. It'll be good for your soul. And then rule number nine, he concludes with, nobody is perfect. People are going to tell you you're perfect just the way you are. You are not. That's a good reminder at the MTV Awards. They're going to tell you you're perfect. You are not. You are imperfect. You always will be, but there is a powerful force that's designed you that way. And if you are willing to accept that, you will have grace. And grace is a gift, he says. And like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, that grace was paid for with someone else's blood. Do not forget that and don't take that for granted. Those those are Chris Pratt's rules for life for this young generation. And in the midst of it, he wants them to pay attention to a God and to the fact they have a soul. So what is this soul that we should pay attention to? What is it that Jesus doesn't want you to forfeit and ultimately lose out on and be the least successful person? What is the soul? Well, the word soul first appears in Genesis. It's the Hebrew word nephesh. So if you go to Genesis chapter 2, we see that God has created Adam out of the dust. Chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became, in your Bible, in the ESV, it says, a living creature. That's one word in the Hebrew. It is nephesh. Became a soul. And so he's, he's formed man out of dust, but unlike the animals, he's not just an animal of the dust. God breathes his life into this human being. So men and women are not animals. They're something distinctly different. They have the breath of God in them. And because they have God's breath that animates them, that brings life to them, they're called a nephesh, a soul. This is the first time it shows up in your scriptures. That you have a soul because God breathed his life in you. The reason you have a soul is because God has given himself to you. So you're so distinct from just the animal kingdom. And if you read your scriptures, you're going to see Nephesh all over the place in the Old Testament. And this soul that God has given you that you have is thirsty. And like a deer pants for the water, the psalmist says, so your soul pants is thirsty after the one who made it. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul, my nephesh for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So as the deer thirsts for water. What what happens to the deer if he doesn't get water? He dies. What happens to your soul if it's not connected and nourished by God? It's going to die. It's going to die. Your life, your soul, is alive as much as it's connected to God. And the further we get from God, the further we get disconnected from God, the more death we're experiencing in our life. And some of us are very restless because we're trying to chase down so many different things to satisfy our soul, and we're not going back to the one who gave us it. And we live in a culture today that doesn't talk about soul care. It talks about self-care. And self-care is all about the external world that you're trying to get in order so that it feels right with you. But we're still restless trying to get our life together when really someone needs to teach us what it means to care for our soul. Like the deer thirsts for water and will die without it, so your soul thirsts for the one who breathed life into you and apart from him will die. Now, this word nephesh, gets translated into the Greek of suke, which is where we get our word psyche, the human psyche, the human self. And this gets translated in the New Testament, and it's very interesting because this is how we talk about people. People have souls. We count them as souls. So if you go to Acts chapter 2, 
This is, this, this is my attempt to help you understand what soul is in such brevity. I hope I'm not doing more harm than, than good. All right, so Acts chapter 2, verse 41. After Peter has preached and many people have received Jesus Christ, it is said, So those who receive his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's people. It's another word for people. This same word, suke or psyche, is used throughout Acts. It's translated as persons in other places. This is Acts chapter 27, verse 37, talking about a trip that Paul was on with many people in a boat. And he says, we were in all 276 persons or souls, suke's, in the ship. If a, ship, if a ship went down and people died, you would say, how many souls were lost? And so a soul is something that God has given us. It's a soul. It's something that's thirsty to be connected to its creator. A soul is a person. Dallas Willard, I think, says it so well when he just simply says, the soul, you want to know what the soul is? It's the most important thing about you. It is your life. It's you. It's not something that you just have. It's you. It's like your DNA. It's the essential you. It's the true you. It's the fullest sense of who you are. It's the sense of what's going to live after this shell is gone. The human soul is the most important thing about you. It is your life. It is you. I mean, I appreciate Chris Pratt. He's not necessarily a theologian at the, at the MTV Awards. It's so great to direct our attention to the soul, but it's more than you have a soul. The scriptures teach that you are a soul. This is who you are in your being. Now, now Plato, a Greek, a Greek teacher, philosopher, creates this dualistic idea of body and soul and the, and the soul's longing to be freed from the body. I mean, the body is so temporary, so temporal, it's passing away. The goal is actually to have the soul freed from this cage that's not what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach that you are body and soul, that you were dust and he breathed life into you, and your ultimate hope is not to be freed from this body, but to actually be fully clothed in new bodies. This is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that you would not simply be absent from this tent that's fading away, this body, but that you'd be fully clothed with new bodies. Not that you would exist forever as some disembodied soul somewhere in some mystery place. But this is what Christ came to do, which was save your soul and resurrect a body so that your soul and body would be able to live forever. Are you start seeing the value of the soul compared to the things of this world? What would it profit a woman? to gain everything in this life and forfeit their themselves. They would lose themselves, the, the truest version of themselves, the version that's going to live on forever. What would it gain them to be separated from God forever? And the rhetorical answer is nothing. Nothing is more important than for you to care for the soul that God gave you. And so this teaching about soul is absolutely important. It's absolutely important because it is the gospel story. So if you go back to Mark chapter 8, and we pick it up back in verse 31, this conversation about what would it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul is directly coming out of this answer of that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so context matters. What is it about this context that helps us understand the question that Jesus is asking? Well, in verse 31, he began to teach them, now that they knew that he was the anointed one, promised one, the rescuer, the, the Messiah that God would send to redeem Israel. Now that they have that correctly in their mind of who Jesus is, he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. And now Jesus Christ is going to experience great suffering and be rejected, that's shame, from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, he's going to be crucified on a cross by Roman soldiers, which is the most shameful way to die in the first century. There's no dignity associated with the cross. 
So he tells them that he must do these things. See that it says to them that the Son of Man must suffer? It's, it's not even just a projection like this will happen. He's not saying this, this might happen if we go to Jerusalem. What Jesus says is this is required of me. This is a must happen. Why must Jesus die? Well, as the authors of Hebrews say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus is dying the death that we deserve to die because of our sin. But he's dying in place of us so that he would be the one-time sacrifice, the all-sufficient sacrifice, the merit that we would trust in order to be saved. If Jesus Christ does not die on the cross, we cannot be forgiven. Which is why Jesus says, I must suffer these things. It's required of me. And so he goes on, I must be killed. After three days, I will rise again. Now, does he rise just with a soul, with just a spirit? Does he become a spirit being? No, he becomes a resurrected Jesus with a body and a soul from the grave, alive again. After he said these things, though, the Messiah would suffer. Peter took him aside. Peter, who loves him, Peter's the one that just professed Jesus as the Messiah, takes him aside and is like, hey, hey, Jesus, come here. We're not doing that. Now, wh why does Peter do that? Why does he say that? It's because what's in the mind of Peter is that the Messiah would come and conquer Rome. He's going to be victorious over their oppressors. He's going to restore the temple in all of its glory. He's going to sit on David's throne. He's going to rule with justice. It's going to be this material victory for him. Peter has no category for Messiah that suffers. That's a losing Messiah. What Jesus just said is, I'm going to lose. And Peter says, I'm not in for that. I'm here for success. I'm here for victory. I'm here for power. I'm here for influence. I'm here for you to do all the things that I think you should do to make the world great as I think it should be great. And Jesus says, I'm not, I'm not on for that plan. In fact, he says that he pulls then the disciples and Peter in and he rebukes him. He rebuked Peter. Now that word rebuke is the same word that's used when Jesus rebukes demonic spirits in people. When he rebukes the wind and the waves. This is a, a rebuking of an adversary. Somehow Peter has his mind set on things that are adversarial to Jesus. And so he rebuked Peter and said to him, get behind me, Satan. Like you have the things that, that Satan is thinking about. Says you, says, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Things of this world, not on the things of God. Now you can could, you could understand because in Peter's mind, he's never imagined the anointed one, the promised one, the son of man to come and suffer. That's not a category for Peter. Though many of the prophets have already foretold this is going to happen. He's going to be crushed for our iniquities. He's going to be led astray like a sheep off to the slaughterhouse. So it's not as though prophets have omitted this. It just hasn't been in their mind because in their mind it's the success of the world. Strength, power, victory, positions of influence. And Jesus says, no, we're going to win, but we're going to have a greater victory. But we're going to win by losing. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to allow evil to do all that it wants to me. And I'm going to absorb that and take that to the grave. I'm going to crucify that so that we can be done with it. That's what Jesus' mission is. Now, Jesus says, yes, I'm that king. I'm that promised one. And I'm going to the cross. And then he tells all of his followers, if I'm the king and my way to victory is through losing at the cross and you want to follow me, what's your way to victory? It's by way of the cross. So he says, if you want to come after me, you want to follow me, it's by the same way. It's by taking up your cross. So he goes on, verse 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, follow me. If you want Jesus, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, there's a couple words that haven't shown up in our rhetoric lately, self-denial. 
It's about self-fulfillment right now, isn't it? It's find out whatever desires you have, whatever passions you have, and then go satisfy them and fulfill them. And the way of Jesus is absolutely the opposite. That there are desires and passions that you have, that I have, that are contrary to the ways of Jesus Christ. And those desires and those passions should be denied, not satisfied. They should be rejected, not fulfilled. And you're going to have to deny yourself. There are parts of you you have to crucify, put an end to, take up your cross. You're going to have to suffer as well. Anyone who wants to come after me, take up their cross and suffer like me. Now, I don't know if Jesus didn't get the memo, but that's like not really great evangelism. You know, real, real like selling the gospel is when you're like, okay, I just give this great message of who Jesus is. He's the hope. He's eternal life. He's for you. Now let's all bow our heads and close our eyes and no one will see you. No one's going to know if you raise your hand. It won't be embarrassing with the people that are all Christians. But just go ahead and, and raise your hand if you want to accept Jesus. No one's watching. Don't worry. No one's going to know. We're not even sure if Jesus is watching. Raise your hand. Jesus is like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to grab all the crowds and all the followers, everyone who's interested in me, and tell you, hey, this is the way. And everyone's going to see it and know it. It's going to be very public. You need to deny yourself, and you need to suffer with me. Your life is going to look like you're losing. There's going to be times when it feels like you're losing because you're not gaining the world, the applause of the world, the stuff of the world. But this is the way to win. This is the ultimate way in which you'll be the winner, is by the way of the cross, through the grave with Jesus, to victory. And then he asks this question. I think this question is so good. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. So let, let's do some raised hands, okay? I, I promise I won't mess with you. Raise your hand if you want to save your life. Okay. Everybody's hand should be in the room, up in the room. Raise your hand if you're going to lose it and die. Is everybody in the room? So here's the problem. Everybody in the room, everybody in the world would raise their hand. Who wants to save their life? I do. Who's going to die? I am. Jesus says, okay, so everybody wants to save it. Everyone's going to lose it. But here's a secret. I can teach you a way of losing it. So you're already going to lose it. You can't keep it. It's 100% death for everybody. But I can teach you a way to lose it now that will actually save it. And that's what Jesus is doing on the cross. It looks like a loss to everyone. There's crucified Messiah. Loser! He's like, oh, you have no idea. I am victor. I am the one that will conquer the grave and be resurrected in three days in body and soul. And I will live forever. And anyone, anyone who gives up their life now unto me, like you're surrendering your life now unto me, you're depositing your life to me, you're dying to self. You're saying, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I'm not my savior. You're my savior. I'm dying unto Jesus. Well, then I will take you through the grave and I will take you to life forever. You will not be the ultimate loser you'll be the ultimate winner. Who wants to save their life? Who's going to lose their life? Let me teach you a way. If you lose it this way, everyone's going to lose it. But if you lose it this way, then you'll save it. Now remember what we opened up with? Mike's getting hot. We'll give him a second to dial it in. Remember we opened up with two boats? This boat over here has the biggest rooms, king bed, room in your closet for all of your things you can bring along, the finest foods, the greatest entertainment, pleasure galore. And this boat over here is just so small. 
only has a few seats in it. You paddle it yourself. You say, well, which boat do you want to be in? Well, there's one essential question. Do you know what that question is? Is one sinking? I'd like to not be aboard the one sinking. And so you're on the Titanic, and it's like the greatest ship the world has ever produced. The tickets are going fast. Everybody that's somebody is on it. And then it's sinking. And do you want to be on it anymore? Or would you like to be on this really small, humble boat that's almost embarrassing, but will preserve your life? I'd like to be on this boat that's not sinking. And what Jesus is saying is, what does it profit you to have all of this if this is ultimately sinking? Anyone who stays here dies here. Or, jump in with me. It's not flashy. But will actually save your life. It's the only way. You say, well, that looks like suffering. That looks cold. That looks hard. Absolutely. It's the way of Jesus to the cross, through the grave, to eternal life. He says, anybody, this is where he ends, so anybody who wants me can belong to me. There's nothing you've done that keeps you from me except you. You can bring all your sin to me. That's why I died on the cross. I crucified all that on the cross. He simply says this, though, for whoever is ashamed of me. Like you, people find out you're a Christian. You're like, oh, I'm not, not really that big of a Christian. If you're ashamed of me, he says, and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed. Like, I didn't know you either. But if you die to self and take Jesus now, you'll be the biggest winner. You'll live forever. And what he says here is that you're ashamed of me and my words. The same phrase here in 35. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels. That's, that's his words. His story, the cross. So if you connect yourself to Jesus and the work of the cross, there's nothing, nothing that can ultimately harm you. Your life is secure with him. I can't think of a better way to end this morning than to move to the Lord's table and take communion together. If you're helping with communion, would you come forward at this time? What is communion? Communion. Is union. Communion is to have union, fellowship, connection with God. The, the author of the soul who breathed life into you. This is soul care. This is the work of Jesus Christ. Grace that was purchased with another's blood for your behalf. And anyone who would say, I'm with him. I'm not ashamed of him. I belong to him. I have surrendered my life to him. Is welcome at the communion table. So if you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be your Lord and Savior, please, when the communion comes, receive the grace of Jesus Christ. If that's not true of you today, I would say don't wait any longer. Move from this boat to this. Move to Christ. What would it gain you to have everything in the world and lose your life, your true you, the essential you, the one that will live forever? And so let's bow our hearts and prepare ourselves to receive communion. Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Thank you that he would come and do what we cannot do for ourselves and that he would forgive us. Thank you that he would not abandon us to the grave but take us through it into eternal life. And so Lord, we gather to remember you this morning. Father, I pray for all my friends in the room whose mind has been the, on the things of this world to alleviate their suffering. 
to try to acquire the things that are fading, to try to identify themselves with the things that are temporary and have distanced themselves from you this past week. I pray that this would realign us as a community back to our Lord Jesus Christ, where we remember him and proclaim his death, the gospel story that we belong to until his return. Amen.